Good morning and welcome to West Salem Christian Church's worship service this morning. I'm so glad that you've joined us and I'm excited again this morning because we're talking about joy. How to find joy uh, even in, in tough situations by living not for ourselves but for other people. So I'm glad that you have made the time to be here this morning so that we can give God the honor and the glory for who he is, worship him, and allow him to speak to us this morning. So I want to encourage you to just participate and, and uh, sing along with the songs and, and uh, worship together this morning as we lift up the name of Jesus. You're 
stars they wept The morning sun was dead The Savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him breath he gave as heaven looked away the son of God was laid in darkness a battle in the graves the war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake stone was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated Forever He is glorified The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is Lord. Good morning. I'm Larry Garrett, one of the elders here at West Salem Christian Church. We're going to continue with our worship now as we lift our praise, our thanksgiving, our confessions, and our fears to him in prayer. Jesus is our good shepherd. If your life is outside of his loving, watchful care, and the results of living it on your terms has produced a dead end, Listen carefully during the service for his voice calling you back to salvation and service. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing our prayer this morning. We are amazed by your power when we observe your creation. The magnitude and complexity of it are stunning. 
Our own bodies have been knit together in marvelous detail. You spoke all of this into existence and looked upon it with pleasure. You walked with us in the garden in close relationship until we made the choice to disobey. It is our sin that created the separation which cannot be changed without your grace. It was offered to us in Jesus Christ, whose humility and obedience led him to the cross. He allowed his life to be sacrificed for us because his, of his victory, we have been regrafted into the tree of life. Now we give you all praise and glory for him. Father, we look into our hearts, reflecting on the past week, and ask for forgiveness for our sins. Like Paul, we find ourselves doing what we know we ought not to do and straying from you. Thank you for shepherding us back into your flock. Give us wisdom and renew our strength and our resolve to serve you. Our hearts are grateful for the providence that you have extended to us this week. No matter what our situation, blessed be your name, O Lord. Our prayers continue for our neighbors, our city, and our nation as we face illness and all manner of difficulties created from the pandemic. Thank you for your answers to ongoing prayer involving accidents such as Dwight Ettinger. And Father, when we feel fear as we wait for your answers or receive a no, we ask for strength and resolve against Satan's attacks on our faith. And now, Lord, as we rejoice in the encouragement of your word, we ask that as it's proclaimed by Seth, that it may result in a harvest of souls and spiritual growth for your church. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Tell me if you recognize any of these names. TikTok, WhatsApp, Reddit. Some of those are a little less well-known than others, but what about Snapchat or Instagram, Twitter or Facebook? Almost all of us have heard of those. There's are these giant social media platforms, places that we can share and find information and virtually connect with people all over the world. And these social media giants have seemingly taken over a huge part of our lives. In fact, a lot of us probably can't even imagine what life would be like without them. And before you try to get ahead of me this morning, I'm not trying to tell you that social media is evil and that we should just dump it all together. I have social media accounts. We have social media accounts for the church. Just like anything else, social media is a tool that if we use it in the right ways, it can have all sorts of positive impacts. But when we look at social media, it really shows us some interesting things about the world and about ourselves. Most of us think of social media as a window for us into the world. It's a way that we can see uh, what other people are doing and what's happening around us. But Really, what social media does, instead of being a window to the world, it becomes more of a reflection on us. And the reason that I'm starting out talking about social media today is that I think it applies to what Paul talks about in the second chapter of the book of Philippians. I think there's a reason that social media has grown so fast and why it's caused some of the problems that it's caused. See, social media puts each of us right at the center of everything, and it allows us to live in our own little universe. And there are some definite risks to putting us at the center of our own universe. There was a commercial a while back for uh, Hotels.com, I think it was, and there was, the spokesman talked about hate liking something. And if you don't know what that is, it's when you click like on somebody's post online, even though deep down you really hate what they posted. And we all do it. You're, you're stuck at home working all weekend and your friend posts pictures of their family with their new boat at the lake and you're like, oh, how nice for you. Life must be so difficult. Like, 
Or you see someone you know, and, and you know their life is falling apart. They have all sorts of issues and problems, but everything that they put on social media just makes it look like their life is perfect. And you think, oh, I see that you put a nice shiny facade on your rickety, flimsy little life just to hide how much of a mess you are. Like, or even just people who you're jealous of, someone who's just too nice or that, somebody that just has to have everything go right for them. Oh, look, they had another great thing happen to them out of the blue while I had a terrible week. How nice for them. Like, and if you're on social media, we've all sarcastically hate-liked something before. And we have all, we've all let ourselves get angry and upset by something that somebody else has said or done. Because we judge everything by whether we like something, agree with something, or are offended by something, or even if we're envious of another person. And from the world's point of view, me being at the center of everything sounds like a great idea. We have a deep desire to be in total control of our own lives, but when we find ourselves there, it doesn't work out very well most of the times. And after a short time, we usually start to look for problems and things to complain about, and then we start trying to find somebody else to blame for our problems. So it's a tough thing for God to ask us to put him and others in front of ourselves. It sounds like a great idea, but it can be a huge struggle to actually put into practice. But there's a theme that we see all throughout Scripture, from Proverbs 3, which says, He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. To James 4, which says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. To the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, where he says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is a biblical principle that we see over and over and over again, and it's a part of God's character. God exalts the humble, and he humbles the arrogant. And I think God has built that into us, too. It's, it's a part of how he created us. I mean, how do you feel about arrogant people? Have you ever been around anyone that was just completely full of themselves? Maybe in school or a sports team or at your job. We've, we've all run into those people who just, through their attitude and the way that they carry themselves, they make it clear that they think they are way better than anyone else. And how do we respond to that? We don't like those people, do we? We won't go out of our way to help them. In fact, sometimes we might actually root for them to fail. And there's something within us that feels vindicated when an arrogant person gets taken down a notch or two. And I think we naturally feel that way because that's how God feels too. And on the flip side of that coin, most of us feel the same way as God does about humble, selfless people with a, a servant's heart. If there's someone who's always doing things to help and to serve other people, if there's someone who, who never makes themselves the center of attention, if there's someone who always looks for the positives and always finds ways to, to just encourage other people, you like those kind of people, don't you? Those are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with. Because God's principles just work. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So as we think about that principle, let's start and look at the beginning of Philippians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4 say, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Again, like we talked about, that is a tall order. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing? How are we supposed to do that? Well, Paul gives us the answer right there in that verse, but it's a little bit easy to miss it because of the way that he says it. He shows us we can find joy in putting others first because Jesus put us first. Just look at what Paul says at the beginning of that verse. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness 
and compassion then make my joy complete, he says. What Paul is really reminding the people in Philippi and reminding us is we really do have those things. We are united with Christ. We're not in this alone. He's with us. We have the comfort of his love. We don't have to try to find our contentment, our fulfillment, or our value in anyone else. We can rely on the love of Jesus. We have unity in the Spirit. Again, we're not in this alone. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the rest of the church, God's people, to encourage us and to help us lift up others. And we are allow, if, we, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, he is going to produce tenderness and compassion. Our hearts will be open to recognizing and understanding the needs of others. When we allow the Holy Spirit to produce that tenderness and compassion in our lives, we can start to really see people the way that God sees them. So when God asks us to put other people first, he doesn't ask us to do that in our own strength. He asks us to do that in light of the fact that Jesus put us first and he laid his life down for us. He asks us to work for the benefit of others because we have benefited so deeply through Jesus. He asks us to work toward healing and uplifting people because we have been made whole and lifted up out of our sin and brokenness through the sacrifice of the King of Kings. In short, God asks us to exercise the key trait that Paul mentions here. And this is really the word that the whole second chapter of Philippians hinges on. And it's something that was one of Paul's great sources of joy. And it can be for us too. It's humility. Humbling ourselves and putting God and others above ourselves it is what Paul is really getting at here. And I want you to take just a minute and think about a person in your life who lives in humility. Somebody who embodies selflessness. Someone who seems to have mastered the art of putting other people before themselves. For those watching on the live stream, if someone came to your mind, share that. Type it in the comment section so other people can see. Uh, we've all been blessed to have those humble people in our lives. And we admire them, don't we? We look at them as examples and we try to live like them. Well, the good news is that we all have access to the best example of humility in the history of the world. Paul lays it out for us as he continues in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus is literally the embodiment of humility. Paul illustrates some very important things about humility in, in just those few verses. First, in order to forget yourself, you have to know who you are. Forgetting yourself is not a negative thing here. I mean, being able to think of others first. Jesus knew who he was. He was in every way God. He knew exactly what he was giving up and exactly what he was gaining. Jesus laid down heaven. He laid down being in the direct presence of his heavenly Father. He laid down everything and he loved us enough to become like us. He crammed himself into a weak, fragile human body and he lived for us. And then he laid down his life and he died for us. And that's the next thing Paul shows us here, that in order to lay down our lives, we have to pick up our cross. See what Jesus did by picking up his cross and laying down his life was he obeyed. He obeyed all the way to the end. He finished the assignment. He passed the test. He completed the race. And now with him as our example and our Lord, we can obey. We can lay down our lives. We can put ourselves second and take up our cross and follow him. And that takes a whole lot of humility. But with all that Jesus has done for us and the spirit that he's given us, it becomes a whole lot easier. And as we read on, we see that we can find joy in putting others first because when we live in humility, God gets the glory. Again, Jesus is our example in this. Yes, everything that he did was for our benefit, and he did it because he loved us. But beyond that, ultimately, everything that he did, humbling himself, becoming a man, living a sinless life, dying a cruel death on a cross, and rising again, conquering sin and death, all of that was for the glory of God. Humility, 
Jesus' humility and our humility glorifies God. We just read Paul's description of Jesus' humility, and then in verses 9 through 11, Paul tells us about the results of that humility. He says that because Jesus obeyed and humbled himself to die on a cross, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. To what purpose? To the glory of God the Father. Because of his humility, Jesus is exalted to the highest place. Again, this shows us that part of God's character is to exalt the humble and to humble the arrogant. And even as Jesus is exalted, the glory goes to God the Father. Just like he'll get the glory when people see us living humble lives. And that's really what it's gonna, what's going to make the difference, is, is people seeing us live in humble obedience. Because when we're living in humility, actions speak louder than words. How many of you have a complainer in your life? You know who I'm talking about, the person who can just find something to complain about no matter what's happening. There are people like that everywhere. And it seems like we can't get away from them. Even when we're trying to look at the positives, there's a, they're the person who can find the tarnish on even the shiniest silver linings. But in a world of grumbling, our humble obedience can speak loudest of all. Look what Paul says in verses 12 through 14. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. There are always going to be reasons to complain. And most times there are going to be good reasons, valid reasons to complain. Most of us could probably come up with a list of five very reasonable complaints about our lives in less than a minute. But what good is complaining going to get us? Grumbling and arguing usually just lead to more grumbling and arguing. And, and when all we're doing is grumble, grumbling and arguing, we never get anywhere. We never get anything done. But when people see someone humbly going about their business, doing the right thing without complaining, they take notice. Paul says, if we go about our lives that way, we are going to stand out to people like stars in the sky. All the grumbling and complaining and arguing just becomes a dull roar after a while, but the life of a humble, obedient servant of Jesus Christ following their king cuts through the din and speaks clearly. And when we're not distracted by grumbling and arguing and when we're putting other people first, we'll be able to see how we can use our strength and our position to push others forward. Now those words, strength and position, might sound like they go against what we've been talking about this morning, about with humility, but they don't really at all. Humility is not thinking badly about yourself, it's thinking of how you can benefit others. Sometimes we get the wrong idea about humility. We think that in order to be humble, we have to become like a, a doormat that people just take advantage of all the time. We get the mistaken idea that, that we have to act like there's just nothing good about us at all. And we think uh, that we, we can't have any ambition or drive, and that's not what humility is at all. God wants us to have, have ambition, and he wants us to use the gifts and talents and strengths that he's given us. Paul only warns us against selfish ambition. And it's annoying, isn't it, when people who are clearly really gifted at something try to act like they're not? If you try to give somebody a compliment and they just won't accept it and they, they act like it's, it's rude for them to, to get any recognition for something that they've done, it's a good lesson to learn how to graciously and humbly accept a compliment. And acting like you're worthless is not what humility is. Paul shows us real humility at the end of this chapter. Beginning in verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. 
For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Paul uses his history and his relationship with the church in Philippi to build Timothy up. He uses his reputation to encourage the church to receive and listen to this young man that he's going to be sending to them. Paul demonstrates for us that humility involves encouraging others and helping them to succeed. Using your position and influence not to further your own interests, but to create opportunities for other people. Maybe it's finding a way to mentor a younger person. Maybe it's asking honest questions to someone that you know is struggling. Maybe it's stepping outside your comfort zone and talking to somebody that you don't even know. Share your life with people. Tell them about your mistakes. Share your, your times of struggle and, and sh- tell them what God has taught you and how he brought you through. Use your life to show others how important they are to their heavenly father. So as we go into this next week in a time when we have so much to complain about, let's find joy and humility. Let's have the same mindset of Jesus and in humility value others above ourselves and look to the best interest of the people around us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that Jesus has shown us such a clear example of humility, that he emptied himself, he he became a man, he, he lived through everything that we go through in our lives. He faced every temptation, every struggle that we face, and he overcame those. He lived a sinless life, and he died for us. And he rose again to free us and, and so that you could have the glory. So we ask that you would help us to live in that example of humility, not, not pretending like we don't matter, but, but realizing how much we matter, that we matter so much to you that you sent Jesus to, to lay down his life for us. And that we would then use these lives that you've given us to give away to other people and to to lift them up and to, to help them to put ourselves second, to think of other people first, again, so that you will be glorified. We thank you for the opportunities you're going to give us this next week as we we go about our lives, that you're going to put people in our path that will allow us to, to humble ourselves and to show them your love through our humility. We pray that you'd help us to step into those opportunities and that you would use and work through our lives. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the sea should I ever need reminding how I have been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Death that for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer the slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas 
Should I ever need reminding What power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody Now that power lives in me There is another in the fire There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar. In the heavens, as the space between where's then I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Yeah, I know I will never be alone. Be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be This is our time of communion, so if you have emblems at home that you want to get together, bread and juice or whatever you have, this would be the time to get those together as we get ready to take communion together. I want to just read from uh, James, the first chapter uh, this morning, beginning in verse 22. James has always been one of my favorite books because it's so straightforward. And, and when he says something, you can read it at face value most of the time and understand what he's talking about. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then looking, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And I appreciate the fact that we get to take communion together each week. Because I think that communion is, is part of that looking at yourself in a mirror. And it's so easy for us to forget what we look like, to come to the Lord's table and to say, I need forgiveness. I have made mistakes. I've fallen short. And I need the grace and the mercy that Jesus offers me. And then to go away and forget what we look like, forget the grace and mercy we've received, and, and sometimes go back and, and fall into the same traps and do the same things over and over again. But we have the ability to come back and to look into that mirror again and to say, I need forgiveness and I need the grace and mercy that Jesus offers me and to know that we will be given that if we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. And not only to look into a mirror and see ourselves, but to look into the face of Jesus, to know that he sacrificed himself for us because he loved us so much and it was so important to him that we be redeemed back to our Heavenly Father. So as we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made and the forgiveness that comes to us through that, let's take the bread together. And let's take the juice to remember his blood that was shed for us.
Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank you for the reminder and the remembrance of communion. Because we need that. We, we do. We, we look at ourselves sometimes. We examine ourselves like you've asked us to do. And then as we go away, we forget the things that maybe we need to change or that we need to work on. We thank you that you are patient with us. We thank you, you've given, you that you've given us your spirit to help us through that, to, uh, to point out the faults that we have gently and to shape us more into the image of Jesus. So as we remember his sacrifice, help us to, to uh, devote ourselves more fully to allowing you to work in our lives and, and uh, change us more into the image of Jesus so that people can see him more clearly in our lives. And we ask it in his name. Amen. We've come to our time of giving this morning, and we always offer an opportunity for you to give financially if you'd like to honor God that way. And as I was thinking about giving this morning, I was reminded of a story that a friend of mine told me. He was a pastor over in Idaho, and it was a large farming area, and uh, sometimes during the harvest when the farmers were working all day and all night, uh, they would come to church in the morning on Sunday morning, and, and they'd fall asleep during his sermon. And he had one young farmer come to him one day and apologize and say, I'm really sorry that I, I fell asleep during your sermon. I just was so tired. And he said, look, I'd much rather have you here asleep during the sermon than asleep at home or, or at home working because your son was sitting next to you uh, in the service this morning. And he saw that you made church a priority even when you are so busy. And it reminded me of, of times that I've had with my friends, a lot of whom are, aren't Christians and, and really have no uh, involvement or anything in the church or in, in giving uh, to, to God at all. And, and we've talked about how I give to the church. Now, I'm not saying you should go out and brag about how much that you give. Jesus actually tells us not to do that. But sometimes when we're able to talk about our commitment to giving to the church and to God's kingdom, it can be used in constructive ways. In uh, Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when I've talked to my friends about giving to the church, and they've asked me how I give or, or how much, when I've told them, a lot of them have been really surprised. And it's not because it's some huge amount that, that I give. It's because I think they realize, whoa, he really does believe this. You don't have to even believe the Bible to know the truth of what Jesus said. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when people know and see that we give to God and his church, they understand that our heart is there. We really believe what we say we believe. Our heart is invested in God's kingdom and in his church. And so I want to invite you to give this morning. And I want to invite you to find ways to use your giving and your service to God to encourage others and to show them what you really believe and, and uh, where your heart is, and maybe their heart will be drawn a little bit closer to God. Thank you again for being here this morning. I want to invite you back next week. We'll be continuing through our series on Philippians, talking about Philippians chapter 3, and, and uh, again, how we can find joy, the joy that Paul had as he wrote that letter, even from prison. So uh, come back next week, invite a friend, uh, post on your Facebook or social media, whatever, about, about uh, the opportunity to join us for worship next week, 1030 here online, or uh, we'll be meeting outside once again for worship. But let's pray as we get ready to sing our last song and to, uh, to close our service for the day. Father, you are so good to us. You give us such good gifts. And we really are surrounded by, by your good gifts so much that sometimes we don't even recognize them. But we pray that you would help us to, uh, to humble ourselves and to see all the amazing things that you've given us and especially the opportunities that you're going to put us in. And, and we pray that you'd help us to just focus on Jesus and to see his example of laying down his life so that we can more fully give our lives to you. Watch over us this week. Bring us back safely next week and, and uh, just use our lives for your glory the, uh, the rest of this week as, as we uh, seek to honor you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning life around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, yeah, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 